On today's episode of The Nikhil Hogan Show, I'm excited to talk to one of the top violinists in the world, Christian Howes. We talk about his background and how he developed into one of the top jazz violinists, his approach to composition, how he is helping students around the country get introduced to improvisation with his organization Creative Strings, his opinion on the state of music education, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. everybody and welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show. My guest today is world-class performing violinist, educator and composer Christian Howes. From 2001 to 2009, Christian Howes was an in-demand violinist on the New York scene collaborating with a bevy of top-shelf jazz artists including Randy Brecker, Jack DeJanette, Steve Turr, Greg Osby, Dee Dee Jackson, Lenny White, Frank Vignola, Joel Harrison, Daphnis Prado, Dave Samuels, Spyro Gyra and a four-year chair in saxophonist Bill Evans' Soul Grass Band. House was a favorite of the late Les Paul, with whom he worked closely for 11 years. Les Paul said, It used to be you could hardly find a good jazz violinist. Nowadays, there are four or five really good players, but there is nobody better than this guy. Since 2011, House was voted number one in the Downbeat Critics Poll under the Rising Stars Violin category, named among the top three jazz violinists in the Jazz Times Critic Poll, and nominated for Violinist of the Year by the Jazz Journalist Association. He received the Residency Partner Award through Chamber Music America for residencies in school orchestras, earned a USA Artists Grant through the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, and was invited by the U.S. State Department to teach and perform as a cultural ambassador in Ukraine and Montenegro. His 2013 release on Residence Records, Southern Exposure earned recognition in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Downbeat, Jazz Times, as well as a six-night run at Lincoln Center. His 2015 release, American Spirit, was named among the best jazz albums of 2015 by the Huffington Post. House is the founder of Creative Strings, a nonprofit organization with a mission to expand music education through the creation of online curriculum and annual summer conference, dozens of visits to schools annually teaching improvisation, contemporary styles, and related subjects. Christian House, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. You you are a person that I think is a rarity amongst people of your instrument, the violin. You are actually an improvising violin player. You have experience not just for jazz, but actually a plethora of many, many styles. And you're good at playing these styles. It's very hard to find somebody with that breadth of ability. Let's start with your background, because I'm very curious to know how you developed. Because I know you started off with Suzuki, right? Yeah, I was a Suzuki kid from age five, uh, classical violin, you know, real, my parents were serious about supporting me in that. And, uh, so a lot of, you know, activities for people that are trained classically in the Suzuki method, you know, you've got a private lesson once a week, a group lesson once a week, regular play-ins, recitals, institutes in the summer and, uh, you practice, you know, most days and, uh, you and my mom was the kind of the practice parent she would sit with me. And so I was a real Suzuki, uh, Suzuki kid, you know, um, and, uh, you know, loved it pretty much. And, and when I got into high school though, I really wanted to be able to relate to, you know, some of my friends that were starting rock bands and were just being creative with music, even though they didn't have that kind of classical training that I had. So I would be in the proverbial garage band or basement rock band and, um, really, uh, mind opening experiences in a way, because of course I went into the room thinking that I was the most educated and the most trained musician. My friends might've had like, you know, one or two drum lessons or one or two guitar lessons. And I had picked up the electric bass, you know, to, to join them in this and a little bit of guitar as well. And, uh, I was struck. One of the things that struck me was, was how, much I didn't know <laughs> about music because, you know, my friends, they seem to have this, like this kind of inner, um, or they were on the inside of a conversation that I wasn't privy to, you know, because they'd been, they'd already been getting together. And so the way that they looked at music, the skills that they had, the, the insights, the lingo, you know, uh, their, their version of musicianship as rock musicians or whatever you want to call it, um, was, it was kind of startling to me that I was just coming face to face with certain limitations and gaps in my own knowledge as a highly trained elite classical musician. And, and that's sort of, and I started to experience some like envy, you know, I guess, you know, I was, I was jealous of my friends for, 
for them, you know, sort of knowing stuff about music that I didn't know. And I was kind of perplexed by it. I also thought that I also kind of questioned just in, you know, myself, the name, you know, as maybe being not a creative person, you know, I thought, well, these guys are just, they're really creative types. You know, we like to, we like to make these, uh, draw these, these quick conclusions and say like, well, they must just be a, a creative type and I'm not a creative type. And I started to feel kind of down on myself about that. And that was kind of the beginning of me questioning and testing that, that conclusion that I wasn't creative and, and want, you know, getting that hunger for like, how could I be a creative musician and, and how could I augment those skills? That was when I was 15. And really it's been a journey since then. Was that the first time you started playing with other people and in, in a different kind of uh, musical setting in, at the age of 15, yeah. but you, you had yeah. played in, in classical ensembles and chamber music. Well, that's the point. Yeah. I was, I was highly you know, I was really sort of an elite, young classical musician, tons of chamber and orchestral and solo, just, I mean, you know, tons of that. <laughs> right. And so was it pure Suzuki from five to 15? I, well, from five to 12. And then I kind of graduated from Suzuki and got into sort of like what you might call like a finishing teacher, like your finishing, te you know, after you're done with Suzuki, you might go to like a, a real, real serious kind of, uh, you know, pre-college, you know, training. And, and in my case, I went to the professor at the, the local university, Michael Davis, who was a great, uh, pedagogue and a great player. And, and that's when you're done with Suzuki, typically you go to, to be trained by these advanced, you know, like advanced player training. So I started that when I was around 12 or 13, basically got done with Suzuki and I was doing more chamber music, more orchestral stuff and high level, uh, you know, Paganini Caprices, for example, and then, you know, concertos, you know, all Just the so concertos. Just get a bit of a perspective on your ability at, I guess, 12. Um, what concertos were you working on at that time and uh, what kind of uh, advanced pieces were you working on? Well, for most Suzuki grads, you know, I mean, you're done when you're done with Suzuki, you're you're doing Mozart concerti and Vivaldi concerti and Bach concerti. And um and then you start to graduate into some of the romantic concerto repertoire, like the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, Lalo Symphony Espanol, um, Brahms Concerto, um, uh, Sibelius, Tchaikovsky. Um, these are all the the really popular um, kind of schmaltzy, you know, and and flashy concerti, you know, for for violin. That kind of advanced material is, is something that you were just. You were having no. You're just going into that. You were having no problem working on it, and you you gone through that culture, that system, and you were absorbing playing that material pretty methodically, and and it was part of your being right at that point. Well, totally, yeah. I mean, I don't, and I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to say like when I was 12, I was nailing all Peggy Caprice, you know. But but by the time I was 15, I was definitely like, yeah, I was I was very. I was really high level in that idiom, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Uh, when when it yeah. comes to now, from what I understand of Suzuki, I'm a guitar player myself and a pianist. But Suzuki, there's the, you do use your ears. Is that correct? So say you use your ears. In fact, that's an integral part of Suzuki. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because there's a lot of misconceptions about Suzuki. Yeah, I mean, but definitely when you start with Suzuki, it's, it's a high, uh, it's a big emphasis on ear, and so you listen to the records. And, um, and then my mom would even sit down and, and play something on the violin and I'd play it back or she'd play something on the piano and I'd play it back and it's really learning by ear. Is that transcription or? No, you're not reading. I mean, it would be like, it would be like, okay, so here's the first, you know, da, 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 play that. And then I would play it, you know, and okay, now da, 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 da. And then every day I would listen to the whole rec, like all of book one, you know, with Twinkle and the first 12 songs. And then it would start to sort of seep into my consciousness. So, and, and this is the same for every Suzuki well-trained. This isn't about me, you know, this is about the training and the, and the cult. So, because the idea is that when a kid's between the age of two and six, their brain is, is best programmed to absorb language through imitation. That's how we learn to speak is by listening to our parents and people around us. And the age of two, where it's like, we're kind of biologically programmed to do that the best. And that's why, Kids can learn multiple languages when they're young really easily, and later on it gets harder. And so Suzuki's idea was that, you know, well, this is the same thing with music. So we should start kids really young. And that is, I'm glad you said you play guitar, because I'm assuming, like most guitar players, many guitar players don't start playing until maybe 12 or, you know, later. And, and it's kind of interesting. Like, there's a lot that you can 
learn about. So for a classical violin player, the common belief is like that if you start at age seven, like it's too late. And, and you know, but for guitar players, like that, that's ridiculous. Like most guitar players don't even pick up a guitar until they're 12. I wanted to ask you, do, do you have perfect pitch? Yeah, it's a great question also, because I think people define perfect pitch, uh, you know, in different ways. So there are, you know, very rare cases where I believe people are like, you know, kind of born with perfect pitch and they can recognize like the difference between a 440A and a 441 a, you know, for example. And uh, I would not say that I have that. I would say that I developed through Suzuki and what most Suzuki kids develop is they develop the rec- the ability to recognize any note played on the violin that's played in a certain musical language. I guess, the, is that relative pitch? Is that the term you might use? It's it's kind of more than that, though. It's kind of, it's really specific. So if like, if I heard something in the range of the violin, if someone played, you know... You know, if somebody played that, then I could be like, I know exactly what that is. Like, I could recognize that. But if they played this, I probably wouldn't have be just because the melodic language is so different. And those are some of the realizations I had when I started playing the rock band. I realized that I couldn't hear all the chord progressions. I couldn't hear other things. Whereas a guitar player like yourself, you might instantly recognize, like, that's the one going to the four chord. Whereas I was never paying attention to that stuff. So that is, and that's, and that's really coming to the heart of how my pedagogy and artistry changed to recognize that, like, music, the way that music is taught is very separate. There's like different ideas about music. And so we develop these really different skill sets. And, um, you know, a guitar player, you know, develops skill sets that a, a high trained classical musician just never develops and vice versa. It strikes me that there's a certain, there's certain, um, cause I actually started on classical guitar just for a couple of years. And then I, but then I went into jazz, but uh, I recognize big holes in my in my skill sets from my classical education. Well, you mentioned the, the the one going to the five and, and chord progressions, and in my classical education, they did teach us about cadences, but they didn't really tell us about harmony moving from chord to chord. But that would be figured bass or something to that nature. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I I shouldn't have conflated that. I mean, you're you're an anomaly because you're a classically trained guitar player, and so actually, what's what's more uh, similar is whether or not you're trained in classical versus, you know, participatory culture, you know. And when I said guitar earlier, I was really actually... Like a rock guitar setting, a, yeah. Yeah, I was making an unfair stereotype, you know. But but most people who play guitar do come through this kind of, you know, participatory culture, you know, guitar yeah. training no, that exactly. they learn in church. Exactly or they learn what you're in, saying, yeah. Yeah, but for, but for classical guitar players like yourself, you would be more like me in your skill set, typically. And so when you turned 15 and you were playing in, in these bands... What were the specific things that you felt that were missing that this activity of playing with other people in this different idiom shored up these skills? Yeah, so the 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 creative urge, the cre- the the comfort to be creatively self-expressed in in the musical context, you know. So like rock musicians, it's just part of what they do. Uh, also, church musicians, you know, like for example, in African American the United States, at least in that church situation, and I think in a lot of other cultural scenarios creativity is just part of being a musician and it's just natural. Whereas classical musicians sort of at least as a result of the void of that in our training is the fact that I wasn't encouraged to improvise every day. You know, then once you're 15, you're like, what do you mean? Make something up. I can't do that. And you get, you know, so, so that was one of the the things missing for me. Another thing was sort of, um, uh, this, a little bit of a more theoretical inclination to be able to talk about music from its construction in, in even simple ways, just like, well, what's the chord progression? What kind of groove is that? You know, um, just labeling things in music and thinking about, I guess you could say the theory side, although that's not really the the right word. I was really impressed by by you. You're so articulate when you explain these things. Because I have seen some videos of you teaching on YouTube, and you really break it down in such a great way for people who have never done this before. When you were 18 and you were first introduced to jazz, just explain how that, I, I really am so curious how that you changed your it must have been a completely new experience for you and did you have mentors did you take private lessons how did it all come about well you know after my high school years when i was you know kind of experimenting in the in the rock bands with and, and started to like try to write a couple you know kind of songs and pop songs and stuff i also got a chance to play a little bit of bass with the college big band uh but i was you know basically reading 
uh, the jazz bass parts. So there was a little bit of an introduction, although it didn't really mean a lot to me. It was sort of a foreign language. But then when I went to college, uh, I was I was a year young for my grade. So I went to college when I was 17 and I started playing with other bands, um, guys in their 20s on the college scene, kind of in the bars at Ohio State University. It's a big campus, you know, one of the biggest, uh, most highly most populated campuses in the world. I think there's like 70,000 people on campus. Um, so I was playing in, I started playing in a blues band. I started playing in a fusion band and I was playing in another rock band and was continuing to get sort of more of these, um, and I'm not sure what the right, you know, just diverse, diverse experiences, like playing with a blues singer, playing with a rock fusion band, started to think about jazz a little bit. Um, it was all just continuing to kind of open me up to improvising. And I was started to improvise on my violin a little bit. Um, and then, uh, and then, then I got indicted for, uh, trafficking LSD because I was sort of, uh, Mm, I know about this. Yes. Uh, I was sort of, you know, young and discontented and whatever, but, uh, because I was playing in these bands with these guys in their twenties, then all the, all of my peers that had gone to high school with me or that were like younger undergrads, they, um, well, I could, in short, like I could get access to like the weed and, you know, I could go to, I could go to the bars cause I played in the band. And so then this, this one band I was in was kind of like, the Grateful Dead kind of scene, that culture, you know, it was like everybody drank and smoked weed and did mushrooms or acid. That was pretty much the the vibe of that, of that hang. And so, um, and that was kind of my thing at the time I smoked, I liked to smoke weed at the time. And, uh, it was part of how I was coping or not coping with my life at the time for a long story, a lot of reasons, but, um, but anyways, long story short, this, there was a, like a guy who would come and kind of, you know, serve service that whole crowd with weed, you know, and whenever the band would play, like people would, you know, be smoking weed. And uh, this guy, I met him because I was in the band. When you're in the band, you know, it's like you're in the band. So and he was like, hey, and so I was able to to buy weed from him for myself. And then one day he was like, you know, if you got a bigger bag then you could distribute, like you could sell some of the bags and you would be smoking for free. And I was like, well, that sounds good to me. And then so then all my peers would kind of call me up and be like, oh, Chris has got the weed, you know, and um, um. So I I started just kind of handing out bags of weed to some of my friends. And then one day, one of these uh, kids that had gone to school with me, um, or a couple of them said, one of them said, well, my my uncle wants some LSD, but he wants a lot of it. He wants like, you know, eight sheets, you know, and a sheet of LSD is like 100 100 hits. And um, well, you live in Singapore, so (laughs) people in Singapore. You're talking foreign, you're (laughs) talking an alien language, Christian. But I think I know I can follow you. My my dad, my mom, we love we we grew up on the Beatles. So we know about psychedelia, at least through the music. You know, I I, I can follow you. Well, no, the reason I mentioned is because I know that Singapore is particularly has a particularly strong stance on these on these issues. But but anyway, uh, at the time, so the United States. So, you know, I went over to the dealer's house and I picked up the uh, LSD and I passed it to the uncle. Well, it turns out the uncle was a cop. And so I I got indicted and uh, I was looking at uh, what was it? Um, 15 to life. Yikes. And uh, but I was you know, but I, I pled guilty. And so they gave me a reduced sentence of six to 25 years. And uh, so from age 20 to 24, I spent four years in uh, prison in Ohio. During those four years, you know, that was a continuation of my musical education and and other education. And so that even in prison, you were still developing. Well, that, that's when I really started developing a lot more because um, in I would say it in, in more profound ways because of that environment is so unique and it, and it forced me to really, um, contemplate so many aspects of not only musicianship, but also pedagogy, culture, manhood, you know, purpose. I mean, just, you know, many, and they all kind of blended together and, and sort of sorted, you know, kind of helped me, you know, figure out where I was going musically and integrate a lot of these, what had been disparate threads up to that point. Right, right. Well, that's, well, th- well thank you for sharing that. And uh, you, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine what the experience, uh, in, and that must have been a long time ago as well, right? Yeah, that was uh, 92 to 96. So I was 20 and then I got out, I was 24. And, you know, I've, I've in jail, you know, one of the things for me, from a musical standpoint, yeah. Well, how do you was, how do you develop? Do you have 
you couldn't play records in 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 there, could you? Or how did you? Because uh, uh, I think my big overarching question musically is. How did you build your vocabulary? From what you were telling me, you were hanging around some musicians from different styles, and I guess you were like a sponge, right? Were you absorbing everything? And that's it. And were you really just learning new licks and applying them in all the gigs and that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, in jail, I was, you know, it was an extension of immersing myself in these different musical environments, like you said, and trying to sponge off them and try to understand what was so different. And in, in prison, that just, it was like playing in with a lot of, uh, well, I played with some Appalachian musicians in prison. And I also played with a lot of African-American musicians in whether it was in gospel church scenario or like, you know, just guys like beating out and rapping like on picnic tables in the prison yard or like, you know, playing like a little bit of jazz or R and B. Um, and, and these were very, organic situations, like kind of like playing music on the street or something, because you're just in the yard, you're in a prison yard, and you're just trying to make music with whatever you have around you. Did you ever, because you're a violin player, and we know that the the violin is typically associated with orchestral playing and, and that kind of thing, but did you have a fire to prove that you could take that instrument and play it in different styles? Because that wasn't quite done at that point, right? I mean, really in a big, big way. No, it wasn't. You're right. I mean, well, there weren't a lot of examples of it. I mean, there there's there was just a, a handful and they were sort of considered anomalies. But in yeah, that was I started to think about that from the standpoint of playing rock on the violin prior to getting locked up. But when I got locked up, it kind of changed and I really realized that, you know, this this separation of black and white culture in the United States is so profound and I realized how profound it actually was in music and how much black music or African-American music, how deep it was. I started to really get kind of bit by the bug of like falling in love with the music that I was hearing. And, and I also started to see that like, this is a, there's something deeper there that needs to be thought about, um, in, from a cultural standpoint, you know, from like, well, why is it that no violinists are ever exposed to African-American music? Why is it that I had never met an African-American violinist in all of my classical upbringing. And that's that started to motivate me in other ways to think about what it could look like for me to be a, mu- a different kind of musician. Yeah, so those those things started to blur together. You know? Did you have models that you follow? Like, um, I mean, Stefan Grappelli is, is from a much older uh, generation of player and not certainly not rock, but he improvised and he was a good improviser, great improviser. Who was your favorite players growing up? I'm very curious when it comes to jazz and other styles. Well, it was guitar players. It was saxophone players, singers, Any piano specific players. ones? Well, so many. And, you know, so many. I mean, when it was you know, when I was 16 uh, or 18, 19, I was into Hendrix. I was into I, um, Stevie Wonder, Prince. I mean, Joni Mitchell. Um, and then I started to listen to a lot of jazz and funk and gospel and um i got eventually got into a lot of other styles as well of course i had been influenced all along by all of these classical composers as well and from all the chamber music brahms bartok shostakovich tchaikovsky and uh i sort of buried that for a long time and it's you know once i got this idea that like i just really wanted to start really uh, immerse myself and try to understand about black music american black music then but then after about 15 years, I sort of had a realization that I, I needed to come back and embrace all of my roots and, and try to put it together. So. Did you used to write songs when you were, I mean, maybe at 15 and up, did you start to compose? Uh, did you, when, yeah. did, when did you start composing seriously? Uh, yeah, I'd say from around the age of 16, I started writing songs and then, you know, I I, I continued exploring composition um, from then in in various, I would say it's, you know, a compose being a composer is, is like the secondary thing for me to being a, an improvising performer, but it's, but since then I've always done it and, uh, and I still do it. And I, and I compose in a wide array of formats and, you know, methods and, and, and styles. Yeah. Let's talk about 10 yard 1998. Give me a sense of that album. We can talk about a couple of the tracks there. Well, 10 yard was, you know, they were songs that I wrote in prison and 10 yard was one of the yards. There were 10 dorms in this particular prison, the second prison that I was at. Um, and a dorm is like a warehouse, you know, it's like where there would be like uh, 
250 uh, prisoners sit on beds next to each other in a, in a wide open room, like a warehouse, you know. And um, but there would be different uh, yards, at, you know, next to some of the uh, the dorms, and then there was like a general population yard. Well, the ten dorm was the honors dorm, and by the time I was in my fourth year. Uh, being locked up, I was able to move to the honors dorm because I hadn't been in trouble for a while. And it was the kind of thing where you can get in a lottery and you can get into the honor dorm. And that's where it's like the quiet dorm in a way, you know. <laughs> and um, but there was a lot of very, you know, seriously hardened criminals that were in the honors dorm, but they, you know, that had been locked up for 20 years. And but they were just they knew how to do their time and they kind of had it down and they just wanted to get away from the rigmarole. And so but 10 yard was a very peaceful place because it was the only people that could go on 10 yard were people in that honor storm and maybe one other cell block, you know, the old timers cell block. And so that yard, I could go out there and feel kind of safe and, um, and peaceful. Um, and there was a, there was weights out there and there was a, you know, a track where people would walk and then people could gather and, and I would go out there and I would play my guitar or play my violin. And sometimes I would play music with other musicians. And so, so I named the album off to, after that because it was sort of this, this, this piece that I found, you know, while, you know, creating, you know, in, while I was locked up. Um, but there's, a, there's a lot of tributes on the album to yes. other musicians that I right. collaborated. Right, Otis so, Skoll, uh, Trains Maiden, uh, Song for Tony. Could you talk a little, like, let's start with maybe Trains Maiden. Describe, uh, let's talk about the music there. Well, Trains Maiden, it's funny, it was, uh, um, it's obviously a tribute to Coltrane, but but I was naively under the impression that John Coltrane had written the song Maiden Voyage, which was wrong. And so the, the, so the, the vibe of the tune starts with the same kind of vibe and chords from Maiden Voyage, actually. You know, and uh, but I came up with a different um, melody for that. And then uh, Odisco was uh, John Schofield. And so I was to answer your question, I was able to listen to cassette tapes in prison. And guys would at the time we had cassette tapes and you could get a boom box and and you could put your headphones in. And so you could you could like order through the mail like a tape. And that was a prized possession, you know, cause we didn't have a lot of money and then guys would pass around tapes and trade and share tapes. So I checked out, these were some of the things I was listening to. While I was in prison. I listened to a lot of Pat Metheny, John Schofield, Bill Frizzell, Coltrane, you know, and, uh, and then a lot of Gerald Albright, you know, a lot of like, you know, uh, George Benton, I was getting into all this stuff and I played a little bit of guitar at the time. A lot of times I would have this like beat up guitar that I could just kind of mess around with. Do you, do you transcribe? I mean, just a question to, uh, do you yeah. transcribe these things? Do you, uh, you must've had a good, uh, melodic yeah. recall, right? From your years of Suzuki training and, and that kind of thing. So do you, um, yeah. how do you absorb vocab? What's your way of absorbing vocabulary? Well, yeah, I did a lot of transcription when I was locked up and, and I would just listen to the tape and write it down and I could pretty much, I don't need to have my instrument in my hand, but, but I was, but I was, because I could hear classical melodies really well, I was really building my ear. I was building on the foundation of my ear and improving it a lot so that I could hear more lines in different languages. And so that did help my ears. And yeah, I did a ton of transcription uh, when I was locked up and I would just, I listen to the tape and just push stop and just write it down. I don't need to usually find my instrument for most of it now. Uh, but, but sometimes certain things I can't hear as well and I'll, I'll figure it out whether it's a, a hard line or whether it's a chord progression or whether it's low register. And, uh, and over those years, my, my ears built. Do you sing these lines or do you just do it in your head? I, mean, I just do it in my head. I mean, I just hear, I hear the note, like, right. you know, if, if I hear, if you play a line for me, like bubble dip and bubble dip and bubble, you know, it's like I, as it goes by, like I, I recognize it. Like, I'm like, I can see it on my violin. I can see it on the staff. I, you know, and I can hear, like, I can see the note name. It's just like, I just, it's just like, it's like, I know what it is. Now that, that leads me to my next question, trans transposition. So does it get complicated if you're trying to do things in multiple keys then? If you have an idea, so I, I'm not really good at transposition. It's funny, you know, it's, it's funny. You know, so, you know, because when you have something close to perfect pitch and you just you just recognize the notes, it's almost like you don't need to think about it in any other Relati way. So yeah, it, you so, don't need to think yeah. about it relatively because it's all there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a so it's kind of like for every 
strength, you know, you might have a, an opposing weakness. <laughs> or so. I always had this impression that people with great, you know, like absolute pitch, they just they just know they just know it, so they don't really need to think about it. You know what I mean? But transposition exactly. actually it is a thing that that you have to think about, right? It, well, totally, unless you develop your ear in a different way. And if you develop your ear in a different way, where you're hearing like you know, like solfege or something, I think people that learn that way can transpose much more easily, but they can but they may not be able to transcribe as easily, you know, like they need a starting point, for example, it's like, well, where's dough? Okay. Now I can fix, you know, but then if they, but then you can give them 12 doughs and they can find the exact same thing, like immediately, you know what I mean? The state of a violin education in the United States or around the world, really, what's your opinion on pedagogy and do you feel there's things that need to be reformed? What things are we overemphasizing? I'd like to hear your take on that. I definitely agree that um, music education uh, needs to uh, grow and transform and evolve in really important ways. And the biggest thing I could say about it is is kind of what we've been talking about, that there's so much separation in sort of like gated communities within, you know, the fact that there's this kind of, if I was going to put it into three threads um and this is very arbitrary but i would say you've got all these on one on one hand you've got all these strains of participatory cultural music and that includes like rock bands it might be like any kind of folk music um and uh you know like and all the participatory culture nowadays is just people learning songs on youtube you know and just figuring it out on their own i mean you've got like for example i'm just thinking of like you know, these uh, these videos on YouTube of like young Filipino musicians who like literally like they just I don't know. I don't think they necessarily took a lesson on guitar or they and they learned to sing from YouTube videos and they learned to, you know, <clears throat> that's just one example. People who are self-taught or who are kind of teaching, you know, in small communities, um, you know, figuring out music however they figure it out. That's the, I think of that as participatory culture. And then you've got jazz studies, which is this kind of academic thread, you know, this kind of, this kind of industry itself. And then you've got the classical world. And so I, these are all kind of disconnected and competing. And I think they need to be more integrated. So like academia needs to be more, they need to think about music in a more integrated way. And, and, so the problem for classical musicians or classical teachers and classical pedagogy is that they're just they're not looking at what they can learn from the participatory culture and or from jazz studies. I, I, I absolutely love what you're doing. I mean, I, I think your your education, your your creative strings. Yeah, let's talk about that. Your creative strings academy. I, I think it's just really great the way you you break down stuff and everything. Um, talk about the mission of the creative strings academy and your approach to teaching strings to be creative well creative strings is a is a nonprofit that i formalized a few years ago and the mission is to um to transform music education through a mixture of online curriculum uh, summer conferences and outreach in schools and so where, where we focus on is really teaching um, the classical world, you know, classical string players about all these gaps that I've mentioned, you know, trying to bring, um, skills and knowledge, um, and insights from the participatory cultural worlds of music and the jazz side of music and kind of show that to classical musicians and say, here's all these ways that you can broaden out to be more creative, to be more empowered through just like knowledge and music and be more broad in your appreciation of different styles. And with that, you can get so many benefits, not only personally from feeling satisfied from that and doing a more varied work as a musician, um, which is just satisfying, but also you can be more marketable and you can be a better advocate for your music and it can be more sustainable and you can spread it more to your communities. How do the kids respond during these classes? If they've never improvised before. How, in your experience, how do they respond to the classes? I think they respond great. I think there's a lot of, you know, I think, cause like you said, I mean, music is great. If you give a kid the ability to engage with music, um, and in this case, a lot of times it's like taking them off the page, you know, they love it as you know, they love any chance to be able to be creatively expressed or get into the music, connect with other people in the music, you know? So yeah, it's, it's awesome. I work with probably 
50 schools a year. Do you have a, a fun story of like a kid who is like pretty talented in the classical field and just really just like a light bulb went on their head when you were explaining something or like an improvisation or, or in a different idiom? Well, I get, yeah, I get these kind of testimonials all the time and stories all the time where just kids just, you know, have a lot of fun. And it's a lot of time it might be the kid who's, you know, in the back of the violin section and usually doesn't feel like they're valued as highly as like the concert master or the first chair, you know? And, but in these scenarios, they get a chance to shine because they see that it's like their unique personality, which is the asset. And so it's not about someone who's a better violinist and somebody's a worse violinist. It's about being different and just celebrating your individuality and being able to bring your creative thing to it. So I see that it's really empowering for kids. I see that they enjoy the feeling of, of being successful at it, that they can do it. Whereas a lot of times with classical music, it's so hard, especially on the violin, you know, it's like, cause everything sounds out of tune and it's hard to get a good tone and it takes 20 years to like, just go, Oh, on the violin, you know, it's like, and, and so let me ask you this question. Can anybody improvise in music? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you, if you open yourself to what music really is and, and a lot of people, when they, what is me, what's your definition of music, Christian? Well, I'll try to, I'll try to answer that question, but first let me say that, you know, a lot of times when people say, well, can people improvise? They're actually, they actually mean something very specific by it. Like, like they mean, can you play over the changes in a way that sounds appropriate to that style, you know? And that's like, that limit is kind of, in my mind, it's artificial. So for example, I get people into a lot of very um, expressive improvisation, you know, like. You know, where. It, now, is that, do you, do, do you choose a key for them or do you just tell them to play notes uh, just to feel it and go for it? Yeah, exactly. So my whole, the po- whole point of that demonstration was that like that, that's not tonal. It, there's no rhythm to it, you know? So this idea of having more free expressions, you know, it's like, what do you hear? What's in your heart and play it, you know? So anybody, definitely everybody can improvise. And I think people really need to open themselves to that and not feel so locked into like music is this style or this song or this groove. It's like, it can be so many things. I got to ask you one, I guess to end off, let me ask you, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to begin improvisation? If just some general advice to, for somebody who wants to get into improvisation, what's your tips for them? Well, one of my friends told me about composition. He said, if you want to do, if you want to be a composer, then Compose your compose a hundred pieces and then be prepared to throw them all away. And then you'll be a composer. And I would say the same thing about improvisation, like improvise every day and give yourself, you know, the freedom to do to let that be whatever it is. Also improvise within specific parameters, like it could be rhythms, it could be techniques, it could be and it doesn't have to be tonal, like it doesn't have to be right or wrong. Do it every day. Record yourself. Do it for a hundred days. After that, you'll be an improviser. Well, Christian House, it's been such a delight to talk to you. You're such a, an articulate explainer of improvisation and getting people to who've never done it before to, to do it. I think you're doing great work, and it was, it was an honor for me to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with the great Christian Howes. It's absolutely fantastic to get a top violinist on the show, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes so we can continue to get more top guests like Christian and get more great insights into music. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you at the next show.